Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, please smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent, and while you're smashing, let me remind you what we got going on over a 10-week span. It's called the summer shoot around it's a series during which we'll focus on 20 notable teams over a span of 10 weeks two per week 20 teams in 10 weeks and we're doing the schools in alphabetical order we've already knocked out alabama arizona arkansas auburn baylor and duke now we turn our attention to gonzaga the zags went 28 and 4 last season won the West Coast Conference regular season title and the WCC tournament. Got a one seed in the NCAA tournament, and then, of course, lost to Arkansas in the Sweet 16. From that team, Gonzaga's lost Chet Holmgren, Andrew Nimhart, so two of the top three scores, but they're bringing back six of the top eight, among them All-American Drew Timmy and fellow double-digit scorers Julian Strother and Rashir Bolton. I've got Gonzaga ranked number one. In the CBS Sports preseason top 25 and 1, we'll see what Deadleg thinks of Mark Few Zags in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors. Whoa. Your dad's a superhero. No, my dad can't handle hot wings. Check this out. Step into the spotlight. Playtime's over, kids. Prepare for war. Hold it, hold it. These things are warm. You got the winter suit. Rated PG. All right, dead leg. I've got Gonzaga ranked number one in the top 25 and one. How are you feeling about Mark Few Zags? Is this the year they cut the nets on the first Monday in April? Is this the year, my man? If it's not this year, we could have said this the past three years. If it's not this year, when's it going to happen? I did write... After Gonzaga, I saw Gonzaga lose in person in San Francisco in the Sweet 16 when they got knocked out by the Hogs. Um, I did write that I thought Gonzaga's best window to win a national championship uh, might have closed. Six of the eight back. At that time, I thought Timmy was going to go. That's also why I wrote that. I thought that uh, – now, I thought it would be best for him to come back. I'm glad he did. Drew Timmy did come back. Um, but at the time when I wrote it, I thought, well, I'll write this. And if Timmy goes, then that, that, that will reflect reality. The reality is they still have another year here to get this done. And those continue to be great. Don't get me wrong. But uh, in Drew Timmy, and I'll lay out his legacy here in a, in a few, um, you might have uh, the last either elite prospect or like all time great player at Gonzaga of the Mark Fuhrer. You might, you might not, but you might. Um, and there's not that many guys that have, that have hit that kind of level. Uh, here's where Gonzaga has been positioned entering the past four regular seasons in the poll. We don't have the preseason AP poll, but GP's got a number one. So they're going to be one, two or three, three at worst when the AP poll comes out in October, Gonzaga has been first, first, eighth and third, the past four years entering the season. Respectively, they have finished First, first, second, and fourth. Final AP poll, as a reminder, comes out the Monday after Selection Sunday. And NCAA tournament results don't factor in. Fair or not, right or wrong, uh, smart or stupid, that's not what happens. So Gonzaga, at the end of the regular season, has continued to match or not exceed expectations literally in three of the four years. And the one year they didn't, they started third and did fourth. So for you to have them won, I think is fair. I have not personally decided where I'm going to put Gonzaga in my preseason rankings. It's going to be hard for me to put them lower than third. Uh, I, in fact, I can borderline promise that I won't put them lower than third. You've got them right there in the wheelhouse of all the teams we've talked about on this summer shoot around series. We might be more in line on Gonzaga than any other team we've talked about uh, just yet. Starting five projection for me is probably Hickman at the Nolan Hickman at the one who I think will be among the biggest. I don't know if Hickman will qualify or not as a breakout player. In fact, we recently just did this exact topic at cbsports.com where we tried to project who will be breakout players. Uh, Hickman was in mind. I went with Zakai Ziegler out of Tennessee when we did that. But Hickman, I think, is going to be humongous this season. Him at the one. Bolton Malachi Smith, transfer from Chattanooga, big-time player. Uh, get them on the guard wings. And then, obviously, you'll have Strother at the four and Timmy playing at the five. I got some stuff on Timmy, but I want to I wanna hold on that. Um what are your overall takeaways on this on this roster and Gonzaga, and why did you ultimately decide to jump them? You've 
explained this previously, but for people that might not have been listening when you did this in April, we're now in August. Uh, you did not have Gonzaga preseason number one coming out of the tournament. We talked about that at length on the podcast. And eventually, I guess it was when Timmy officially decided to come back, you decided to uh, to bump down the Tar Heels. But uh, refresh the listeners real quick on, on why you did that and your thoughts on this roster. Well, I always had Drew Timmy coming back to school. From yeah. version one of the top 25 and one, he was always going to be a part of this team. And, you know, if he was, you know, if, from my perspective, and then if he announced he's leaving, then uh, I would adjust, which is what I'd spend the entire offseason doing. Um, to me, the tipping point was really uh, two things unrelated to Drew Timmy. Um, Rashir Bolton coming back. Uh, nobody thought he was coming back. Like he, he had more or less strongly suggested he was just done with college for better or worse. And so when he announced he was coming back to Gonzaga, that was um, maybe not a surprise in that moment, but it was a surprise relative to what people assumed would be the case um, at the end of the season. And then they add Malachi Smith, the Southern Conference Player of the Year. And, and, and they also added Efton Reed, by the way, who's a five-star guy in the class of 2021, played his first season at LSU. Wasn't great, you know, played 19.6 minutes per game. But um, I, at some point, the talent's just too overwhelming. I mean, they got, they've got a better roster than anybody else. I, I'll keep it that simple. I think Gonzaga has a better roster than anybody else um exactly how they go with a starting lineup i'm not sure you you know anton watson could factor into that i guess mm -hmm. but i'm um, you know when you've got bolton strother timmy all coming back i mean with bolton and strother that's two double digit scores from a team that finished number one at ken palm and was the number one overall seed in the ncaa tournament once again timmy is uh, a, a, at this point you know, getting into the conversation of who are the, the, the best, who's had the best college basketball careers um, uh, of this century. Like he's, he's now on that list. He'll be a preseason first team, all American. And then you add Malachi Smith. And I think this is important. It's clearly a jump from the Southern conference to the Gonzaga level of basketball. I got it, but he was unreal at Chattanooga and unreal for a good team. 20, they won 27 games. Yeah, and they should have won in the tournament game, by the way. That yes. might have been the biggest uh, blown opportunity. They let it, I want to say they let, a, let a Illinois GP like 39 of the 40 minutes in that game. I yeah. might be wrong on that, but it certainly felt like that. Yeah, so they, but they played Illinois like to the final seconds and, uh, you know, played them tough. So he wasn't just, sometimes you get this, these, you know, mid major guys who put up big numbers at the mid major level, but it's for a bad team. It reminds me of a saying, I, I, I a coach, you know, used a long time ago. I don't remember even who, but he said the people, the mistake people make when they look at what somebody average per game rebounds, but somebody, you know, every bad team has somebody who averages 15 points per game. You know, every, every bad team's got a leading scorer. Basically. That's right. It, it doesn't mean anything all the time. Malachi Smith averaged 19.9 points, 6.7 rebounds for a good team a team that was top 70 at Kenpa. so i think he's the real deal i think he's going to be able to play and then whether it's nolan hickman hunter salas caden perry efton reed they have four sophomores who were top you know 60 in the class of 2001 including two five stars all of whom were role players at best last season, whether they were at Gonzaga or in Efton Reed's case, LSU. Can any of them make a jump? If so, like that's, and, and I think, I think Nolan Hickman is perhaps the most likely, although Hunter Salas was the five-star guy um, you know, uh, who enrolled at Gonzaga alongside Chet Holmgren. Nolan Hickman was, you know, top 35 prospect, four-star guy, but you, you, Mark's got a lot of different options, uh, places he can go. You know, Malachi Smith can play point guard. So if Nolan Hickman isn't ready to be, you know, a Gonzaga level starting point guard, then Malachi Smith can do that. You can play them together. You can play Hickman, Smith, Bolton together. You can bring one of them off the bench if you want Watson in the start. Or you know, there's just a lot of different options. You know, how many how many other programs uh, are gonna have four top sixty guys um, who are sophomores, and none of whom were big players last season. All you need is one or two of those guys to make significant jumps, and you've got 
you've got a team that I, I think is is going to finish number one at Kimpom once again. I think the Zags are going to be great. And yes, um, that's not just my opinion. They are the betting favorite to win the national championship. You know, th- if you start looking at betting markets, uh, teams to win the 2023 NCAA tournament, Gonzaga is right there at the top. Um. I'll run down the schedule. We'll do a little, just like in the Duke episode, we'll do a little win total here. But before that, I do want to talk Timmy uh, and and where he's headed towards. So career numbers right now, 1521 in points, 1,521, 618 rebounds, 206 assists. Those are the, those are the, the, the most relevant numbers there. Uh, that comes out to 15.7 points, 6.4 rebounds and 2.1 assists for his career. Not last season for the, his career. Again, 15-7, 6.4, 2.1. I think he increases those averages this season. If Gonzaga plays... 36 out of a possible 40 games. However, those 36 shake out. They play the entire WCC conference and they only get two in the tournament or they get bounced early from the WCC. God forbid we have more COVID stuff, but whatever. Um, if he if he plays to his averages and Gonzaga gets 36 games in, he'll finish, Timmy will, with uh, 2,100 points, 850 rebounds, 280 assists. I believe I was doing a little bit of a, a dive on Gonzaga. I was, I was having fun on this summer afternoon gp and going deep into the gonzaga archives and record books um i can't say with 100 certainty but i believe with 98 certainty he would be the first gonzaga player ever 2100 points 850 rebounds 280 assists um no other zag can match that threshold even if he doesn't get to 2100 points i think if he gets to 1900 and 800 rebounds and 280 assists he'll be the first ever there and Uh, and and keep this in mind i think this is right correct me if i'm wrong he's got another year of eligibility he does. He does. That's the other thing. He does. Uh, every player that basically lost a year because they were in college when COVID happened, you get the bonus here. So he is a senior. He does have two more years of eligibility. If if he wants that, uh, I really feel like this will be the last one, but who the hell knows? He did tweet after w- there was speculation whether he would or would not come back. He literally just tweeted, I'm back at, uh, but, but I think the, like an hour before the deadline. The, so. thing, the thing, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but like if he's making $2 million a year playing college basketball because of name, image, and likeness, it's just whether he wants to get on with it or not, there could be a scenario where it's just financially sensible to play another year of college basketball. I'm not, I'm not saying he he will. I'm just saying it, it used to be a foregone conclusion. Like, it's just time to get on with it. If, if, if my future is playing in Spain or G League, it's just time to go. But now these guys can literally make millions of dollars in college basketball. And, and like that's the reason he's back this season. And if it was enough to bring him back for this season, I just would never rule out that you know, that some of these guys who are great college players for great programs, but not ideal NBA prospects, I, I think we're gonna see them you know exhausting their eligibility while making millions of dollars. I think it's gonna be a normal thing. Yeah, while well, the number will never be outright publicized. I would be downright shocked if Drew Batumi is not a millionaire playing at Gonzaga this season. I got told by multiple NBA sources that the understanding, granted, I did not get this on paper. I never saw Chet Holmgren's contracts or whatever, but people in the NBA, I'm talking front offices, were of the understanding that Chet Holmgren made more than $2 million last year in NIL opportunities. I don't know if Timmy will match or exceed that, but he clearly needs to be making seven figures by returning to Gonzaga and being one of the two or three biggest faces in the sport. But legacy wise, like he's, he's headed toward all time Zag status. Okay. Uh, Gonzaga's all time leader in points. It is not Adam Morrison. I won't even trivia time you with this because you wouldn't know. It's Frank Burgess who played late 50s. I know Frank. Sir. I know Frank. Yeah, Burgess. You know? Okay. Yes. I grew up watching Frank Burgess. All right. 2,196. Um, for Timmy to break Gonzaga's all-time scoring record, he needs to average 17.7 points and have Gonzaga play 38 games, which means make the WCC tournament title game and the Elite Eight. That's for him to break it. If if they don't get to 38 and they play 37, he needs to average 18.3 points. These are doable. He might do it, uh, but he might not. But still, I think he's going to have his number retired. Only Adam Morrison, John Stockton, and Burgess are the only guys honored in the kennel. They're the only guys who have their numbers retired there. I think Timmy's bound for it, and he's going to be the fourth guy. And I think he's in for a huge year. Um, preseason National Player of the Year contender, obviously Oscar Shibway uh, is coming back, so he'll probably win it. But you know, Timmy's Timmy was the preseason national player of the year a year ago, and he's been a two time consensus second team All American. If he plays the way we think he'll play, yeah, Parrish, I mean, he's I don't know where he would stack all time, but like, you know, let's just say since the year 2000, like, yes, he's going to be among the 10 to 15 best careers players in college basketball. If I will also qualify this, if Gonzaga 
can make like minimally another elite eight, ideally a final four. And he's a consensus first team all American. He's got to do it. We got to see him, but he's clearly headed. Uh, he's headed toward that pace. You got a thought on Timmy before I indulge us in this uh, Gonzaga win total. Cause I'm going to read off the schedule. Wait until you get a load of it. I think uh, he's definitely going to have his number retired. I mean, he's already a two time all American, yeah. but it's not yeah. easy. The point is not easy. There's only three Gonzaga players that have ever had it done. So I think he's going to get it, but it's, it's, it's not uh, an easy accomplishment at that university. That's yeah, like he, He's about to be a three time all American yeah, that, that, and, and will probably be a, uh, you know, a two, two, he's about to be a three time all American and he's going to, you know, have, you know, led the Zags to a final four, uh, that's easy. I, I know not many Gonzaga players have their numbers retired, but his is definitely going to to be retired. Um, you know, I, I do think his numbers will increase this year um, because Chet Holmgren's not there. Yeah. You know, and and uh, I, I think you'll probably see him shoot it a little more from the perimeter. Like that is what NBA pe- it's among the things NBA people want to see. And when he went to the combine, he boy he was letting it fly. And he doesn't do a lot of that at Gonzaga, but I, I think you're going to see some of that this upcoming season. And when you start, we ran through the lineups uh, or possible lineups. I think my favorite, if you're comfortable sliding Strother over to the four, because he's more of a wing. But if you're comfortable sliding him up to four, Timmy five. And then Hickman, Malachi Smith, and Rashir Bolton. I think that's my favorite possible lineup because, like, let's just say Nolan Hickman. Is it reasonable to say to uh, to can he be a top fifteen point guard in America? Yes. Is yes. that reason? Okay. And I think that he will be. Yes. Okay. But he's got to make the jump, but that's my pro- my prediction. It's not based on the data yet, but I think he will be a top fifteen point guard in the country. Yes. Okay. So let's just play let's play with this for a second. Nolan Hickman emerges as a top fifteen point guard in America. Beside him, you've got Rashir Bolton and Malachi Smith, two guys who both shot above 40% from three last season on more than four attempts per game. So established high-volume college basketball three-point shooters. Strother, like a double-digit score off a team that was just the number one seed in the NCAA tournament, proven guy. And then a first-team All-American at center. That's, I mean, top 15 point guard, Two guys that shoot above forty percent from three, Strother and Timmy. That's mm-hmm. tough. That's tough. That's 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 what I think is that's the best team in the country. And yet, and I don't want to, I don't want to belabor this point. Um, for so many people, it just doesn't matter. It's just like win a title or shut the hell up, which is stupid. We're not going to relitigate this again. But um, for those listening to a podcast on college hoops in the middle of August. Uh, thankfully you're smarter than that and you don't come to this podcast and you don't rely on those, yeah. sh- you know, ankle, ankle deep, shallow takes. Um, but unfortunately Gonzaga has, has hit that stage where other teams, other sports figures are win it all or, or we don't want to hear from you. Um, let's just move on real quick. Cause we're trying to keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. The, the numbers are the numbers past six years. Yes. They finished first, first, second, first, 10th and first at Ken Palm number one and four of the past six seasons average finish in the past six years is 2.66 average finish in the past four years is 1.25 Gonzaga is still in search of its first national title that is true I can't deny that um, this is also true there has been no better college basketball program over the past six years than Gonzaga both those things are true how many games are they going to win this regular season? Here's the non-conference schedule as it's been assembled here. They actually have not, uh, you know, just transparency. We are pre-taping this, um, so there's a chance, I guess, that Gonzaga will announce its non-conference schedule uh, in between us taping this and it publishing. But uh, the big teams have pretty much been determined here, so anything else is just going to be filler as far as I know. Gonzaga will play at Michi- or play against Michigan State on the aircraft carrier in San Diego to start the season, which is going to be uh, incredible. Uh, and then it gets, goes at Texas. That's the return game. Texas was there last year. I was in the kennel for that. PK-85. They'll start with Portland State. Then they get either Purdue or West Virginia. And then, as we mentioned on the Duke episode, could be Gonzaga-Duke for a second consecutive season on a neutral if the bracket breaks that way. If not, Florida Xavier or Oregon State uh, would be there. Then, uh, quote-unquote, home to Kentucky. We'll get to that in a second. <sighs> Versus Baylor in South Dakota at Alabama and Birmingham in Birmingham and home against Washington, which has been down, but still Washington, still a power conference program. Let me read those again. Michigan State, Texas, PK 85, which could face two high level tournament teams, Kentucky and Spokane, Baylor in South Dakota, Bama and Birmingham, 
home against Washington. BYU is still in the WCC GP, so we're going to go win totals again in the regular season. Here's the data, other data. Gonzaga's average regular season win total the past six seasons, and I prorated this, is 27 and a half. I prorated it in that it lost regular season games, not lost as in result, as in they got taken out because of COVID. So actually the past two seasons when Gonzaga finished with, I think, 24 apiece in the regular season, that's lower than they normally would have had. So I bumped it up a little bit. 27 and a half is about the number over the past six seasons. So that in mind, what is your what is your guess? You just heard what I said non-conference. In the Duke episode, I said 20 what did I say? 22. You had 23 and you said you might go up one more. Um, Gonzaga is your number one team. Number one team. How many games are they going to win this regular season GP? So heading into the West coast conference tournament. Yes. What's their record for 31 games? 28 and three. Oh boy. That is. So you are tech. If the over under based on the data is 27 and a half, you are taking the over. I am going to go under now. I love this Gonzaga team. This is, a gauntlet of a non-conference schedule. I love to see a few scheduling like this, and I don't think they'll run the table in WCC. Now, San Francisco doesn't have Todd Golden anymore. St. Mary's actually should be pretty good. Like St. Mary's should be a tournament team again, I think. Uh, And then we wait and see like Santa Clara lost literally a lottery pick. You can't say that ever except this past, this past season. Uh, So will Santa Clara take a little bit of a step back, but will like LMU bump up a little bit. I think they get picked off probably once. I will go GP. Yeah, That's what I got, by the way, two non-league losses, and one West Coast Conference loss. I will go. Oh, man. I'll go 26 and five for a team whose roster I love, but the non conference is, is, is really challenging. I will go 26 and five for the Zags, which, by the way, if that happens, Gonzaga will not be a one seed. It will not be able to overcome its conference schedule. With that being said, I did want to touch real quickly on the fact, because this is relatively recent news, it's wonderful that Gonzaga and Kentucky have agreed to not a home and home, don't, yeah, but a don't, two don't, years don't, series. Don't, don't call it a home and home series. It's not a home and home. Credit to Parrish because I'm pretty sure Parrish snuffed this out before anyone else. The man covered John Calipari for the better part of a decade. He understands the man, how he's wired, how he talks, the words he chooses, the words he does not choose. And so I think I even foolishly, well, one, I know I foolishly texted Mark Few. Love that Cal's doing a home and home. Eh, no, that's that's wrong, Norlander. Wrong. Uh, Paris was all over this. He wrote a recent column on it. And then I'll just read Cal's. I'll read Cal. And I know you talked about this with uh, with Booney as well. Here's what Cal Perry said after Paris wrote the column and there was some there was some blowback. He said, I'm excited about playing Gonzaga. I'm disappointed that we have to go there first, but to make it happen, I was willing to do that. Playing in front of 13,000 crazy fans in Spokane Arena will be exciting, just like it will be in front of 22,000 fans in Rupp next year. I imagine there will be some BBN and some Gonzaga fans, too, who will sneak into the game this year because there's more seats. Two more tweets from Cal. Anybody that wants to play us in a 6,000-seat facility wants us to lose, and I get that. I tried to look back and find the last time UK played in a true regular season road game with 6,000 or fewer fans. I stopped looking after the 70s you mean to tell me cal literally i'm not saying he didn't but he really went back to 1970 kentucky has not played a road game in a venue with 6,000 or fewer fans since at least 1969 kind of a wild stat if so he said this is great for both schools and i can't wait to get the series started maybe we make this four years that might be that might be might be the cal cracking the door open to saying if we make it four all right mark i'll go and i'll play you if I bet you if that's the case, he'll say Gonzaga this year, Rupp, Rupp. And then the fourth year, he goes back to the kennel. I wish it was at the kennel GP. I guess beggars can't be choosers. Spokane Arena is, is right there. It's wild that Gonzaga has two venues like this. I get it. It's not the end of the world. I just wish, like Beer did last year, like Roy Williams did at Carolina, we were seeing Kentucky. Sheboy Timmy, come on now. Two preseason player of the year front runners. The one, two, the one, two, big star power. It'd be awesome if it was at the kennel. Instead, we're going to Spokane Arena. I got home whatever night the telethon was, Tuesday night, I guess, of last week, and saw the video, and I immediately picked up on it. No, I, I really don't think anybody else did because people were tweeting, oh, Gonzaga, Kentucky, home and home. John Calipari's going to the kennel. And I was like, he's not going to the kennel. 
I could tell by the way he was talking, by the words he was using, because Mark very deliberately said, I, I, I think it'd be awesome to bring my players to Rupp Arena. We never played there. I think it would be awesome. We'll do it. John never said McCarthy Athletic Center. He never said the Kennel. He said, we're coming to, we're going to come to Spokane. We're going to come to Spokane. Just kept saying that. I was like, he's not going to go there. And as I explained, um, he did the same thing when he was the head coach at, at Memphis. So uh, that's where his rationalization is flimsy. He's, he suggested via Twitter that, um, hey, this is Kentucky. We, we, Kentucky doesn't go play road games in 6,000-seat arenas. And I, 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 I guess it, I'll take him at his word, although that's always <laughs> – that's always a. Uh, By the way, I'm be, checking right now the capacity. Capacity is yeah, it's six thousand. It's six thousand. The kennel six thousand. You know, I'll take him at his word. Although that that can be a mistake sometimes, but he also wouldn't take Memphis to the kennel. You telling me Memphis is also too big to go play in a six thousand seat arena? Uh, they play at Tulane every year. It's a four thousand seat arena, so this isn't about not wanting to take Kentucky into a small building. It's about not wanting to play inside the kennel. He didn't want to do it when he was in Memphis, and he doesn't want to do it now that he's at Kentucky. And um, so I, I guess the follow-up question is why? I, I don't know why. I, I don't know what he's so um, hesitant about, uh, but it, it's clearly a thing. And then he adds in the tweet, anybody who wants us to play in a 6,000-seat arena wants us to lose. Like, you know, I was the only one that wrote the column saying go play it in the six thousand. I just arena. want to see the best possible environment that's between right. Kentucky and Gonzaga. That's, that's what right. I want. Yeah, that, that's all I want. As I explained, this isn't about picking a side because, and I guess Hold on, though, should... I did not pick up on that. So Cal was subtweeting you. That was your takeaway. That's what people. Right. That's what that's what some people seem to think. <laughs> okay. like, like like I'm sitting around going, I gotta get. I'm gonna write this column so that I can get put pressure on Kentucky to go to the kennel. So they can lose, which is what I want. Like, I promise you, I don't care. Um, but like he convinces himself of, of that kind of stuff. I've had some people say, well, hey, you know, this isn't just Cal not, not wanting to uh, play at the kennel. You know, Gonzaga wants to take this to Spokane Arena so they can sell more tickets. Trust me when I tell you, Gonzaga does not want this at Spokane Arena. Gonzaga wants this at the kennel. Um, and, and oh, by the way, you, you know who other people who tweeted they, want, they wanted this game at the kennel? Matt Jones from Kentucky Sports Radio. Cal Tucker, who covers Kentucky for The Athletic. They sitting around just wanting Kentucky to lose? I, I, don't, I don't think Matt Jones wants Kentucky to lose. It's just that most of us agree college basketball games and true home environments are the best. Period. Gonzaga's home is the kennel. That's where that game would be best. It would be, as I wrote, awesome anywhere. Las Vegas, the Bahamas, Mass Square Garden, South Dakota, awesome anywhere. But the two places, Gonzaga and Kentucky Plan, would be most awesome, uh, Rupp Arena and the Kennel. And I think it's, I think it's weak that that John won't do it. I, 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 I don't, I don't know why he won't do it, but I, I, I but I know that he won't uh, because he just, uh, he just declined to do it again. That game is scheduled for November 20th. Uh, college basketball, uh, as kind of a big picture takeaway, then we can wrap GP, uh, has really set el itself up for just an unreal November and particularly Thanksgiving week. That game will be on a Sunday. Yes, it's an NFL Sunday. I get that. I, would, I don't know. that. I'm guessing that's an ABC game. Uh, that's just my guess. I don't have that. Uh, you know, if the, the fact that it's on an NFL Sunday tells me that it won't be a CBS. That game. is the one thing I hate about it. Like it is going to. I know. It, it, I it, know. Is, it would just be a massive game. L l maybe not on Saturday because you're also dealing with college football stuff. But like you put that on a Tuesday night. It's perfect. It's going to get completely overwhelmed by the NFL. But that is going into Thanksgiving week with like PK 85. Maui's really good. Battle for Atlantis. This, that is going to be an unreal week of games uh, and a huge week for Ion College basketball because that is just we're going to have so much to talk about. And I love that we get it. We get Shibwe versus Tim. We are guaranteed to get that game uh, and still a, a pretty good venue, not the one we'd want. And I just I think it's it's tremendous that they were able to do it. And Cal, you know, leaning into a, a two year series this late into the summer is not a common thing. So at least give him credit for that, too. Shouts to Devin Downey, shouts to Chester, South Carolina, shouts to Huck and Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Apple. Make sure to 
uh, leave a nice review. Five stars. Write some words. Write some words. There's more of us than there are of them. And if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, please knock that out as well. We'll talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.